part of the way I look at the government is government provides a platform. It provides the basis of network. Innovations come out of the network. The really key thing is that when government people start saying, well, I'm the important person and I'm going to be the centralized control, that tends to be a massive decrease in, in potential and realization of value. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Exponential View podcast. I'm Azim Azar, your host and the creator of the newsletter Exponential View. In today's podcast, I'm in conversation with Reid Hoffman, creator, entrepreneur, investor, the founder of LinkedIn and widely thought of as the sage of Silicon Valley. Before we get to my conversation with Reid, let me tell you about Exponential View. It's my way of explaining how the world is changing under the force of technology. The podcast, these conversations with brilliant minds, is one avenue. The other is through my free newsletter, a wonder missive which lands in your inbox every Sunday. If you haven't subscribed, you can find it at www.exponentialview.co. That is www.exponentialview.co. In today's conversation with Reid Hoffman, we explore two aspects of Silicon Valley. The first is its business culture and why the technology firms there seem to grow so quickly. There's a deliberate strategy behind this, one that Reed calls blitz scaling. We explore the playbook for doing this, why it works, and why it is so different to business as usual. In the second part of our conversation, we talk about Silicon Valley's political culture and how tech firms and their founders can better engage with society as a whole. We dive into everything from the difference between European and Silicon Valley attitudes to government, to the role of the state in dealing with social media's impact on public debate, and mitigating the impact of job losses from automation. For the next few weeks, the Exponential View podcast is sponsored by Spotify. Like many of you, I've been using it as my music platform of choice. So it's exciting that Spotify is also getting into the spoken word through its new podcast service. Just open the app and search for your favorite podcast, Exponential View. I'm delighted to have uh, my old friend Reid Hoffman here on the podcast. Uh, Reid, it's great to have you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I'm so excited because in the few times we've met over the past 15 years, you've always said something to me that I have thought about a lot and it has helped me change my behavior or my company strategy for a while. So I'm excited about sharing that with my audience. And uh, You've been really busy uh, over the last couple of years with your book, your thesis around how companies scale the distinctive Silicon Valley way of doing business, blitz scaling. Can you give us a 20 second overview of what blitz scaling is? Blitz scaling is prioritizing speed over efficiency in an environment of uncertainty. And to make that concrete, that's like the way that Airbnb is spread. That's the way that Uber is spread. That's the way Facebook is spread, LinkedIn is spread, which is going really, really fast to get to a global market and later figuring out things like customer acquisition costs, unit economics, maybe even business model. And frequently since you're doubling, tripling in size – as an organization, your organization also has a certain amount of chaos as well. Right. It's it's one of the things that's fascinating about the way you describe blitz scaling is how it operates at so many different layers of the organization, from culture to communication to financing and technology. Um, and and each one of those is moving so quickly, but there seems to be a pattern that is the hallmark of some of those companies you've mentioned. What is it that connects them and allows them to do that well? Well, it's a uh, it's a kind of an approach, which is everything from a talent organization, go to market strategy, business model, which is the absolute minimum set of things you do to get to massive scale. And and part part of how we we uh, when when you decide to do this is to some degree when you think you're playing for what we call as a Glen Gary Glen Ross market, uh, which I don't know how much of the global audience will will track. Yeah. But it's this classic old film, the second best role for Alec Baldwin now, right. um, which is uh, first prize Cadillac, second prize steak knives, third prize you're fired. So if first to scale is what matters, it's what's the absolute things you must do and the minimal set of things you must do in order to get to scale faster than everyone else. Right. And it's been a really distinctly internet era phenomenon, this, this first to scale. Uh, why is that? Well, basically because what's happening is we're getting a more and more globally connected world, and that means the markets are more connected, which means that you tend to have a thing where the person who's best at that product or service 
tends to have a winner-take-most position, and it's growing. So previously, you'd think, well, it's it's network effects around, you know, social networks or professional networks or marketplaces or or you know those kinds of things, which are of course canonical paradigms of that. But then, as it begins to expand, you realize that also starts playing not just into software, but even into other industries and 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 like hardware. So, uh, the iPhone is an instance of of blitz scaling. Uh, Xiaomi uh, within China, which is a hardware. Uh, you know, kind of cell phone is an instance of blitz scaling. A fast fashion retailer in Spain, Zara. Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of closing the information loop between uh, the sellers collecting information and manufacturing and getting it to stores. Manufacturing in Spain um, is another example of blitz scaling. So it's moving from this pure, like, look, software, cheap, uh, consumer internet, deeply connected. You know, in a globally connected world to globally connected other industries as well. I, I'm curious about some of those those examples uh, because they feel, uh, and especially when you add something like an Uber into that mix, they feel like there's something that's slightly different about um, an, an Uber to a Xiaomi, which is the degree of decentralization that Uber has as it scales in every market compared to a Xiaomi, which is making making handsets. W- what's the, that balance between Firms that are a bit more can be a bit more centralized, like an Apple and an iPhone, and firms that are um, doing a lot more at the edge. Well, they're different. Um, it's just kind of different mods to how you're doing the blitz scaling. So in the in the Uber case, as you know, um, what they did is, is look, this is mostly a uh, city networks. This isn't a global network. It's city networks, and so the importance is is that we get to as many cities and we get as much leadership in as many cities as possible. Mm. So. Uh, that what that means is we spin out and do lots and lots of entrepreneurial teams in each area. Uh, we allow each team to run its own playbook as opposed to, to kind of just per se amplifying the global playbook. And then we kind of do our best as we can to try to learn from each of the markets and then and then spread it. And we use Blitz Capital as the key, you know, kind of arc to being able to kind of out capital spend all of our uh, of our competitors. And there's there's again a shift with Blitz scaling. Towards more and more use of blitz capital. Generally, it's not always you always need capital, but you don't always need to have uh, massive differential capital as the as the as the key competitive weapon. Mm. But that was obviously part of the Uber playbook, and you know part of what they did is they said, okay, well, as opposed to having competitors uh, start all over the place, which some of course did, let's get to m- as many places around the world as possible. Mm. And you've introduced a new term there, actually, which is blitz capital. And when I talk to people, uh, this is a c- classic in the in the UK, right? So one of our blitz scalers, like a Deliveroo, which is in the food retail business, uh, food retail d- distribution, last mile, and um, when they announce their results, their losses will have increased because in the UK, companies have to publish around your results. And of course, the traditional media that is used to looking at analyzing cement factories and pig farms and oil rigs. Yes comes out and says, look, its losses are increasing. Shouldn't it be on a path to profitability? Whereas if you take a blitz scaling model, you look at the increasing losses and you say, oh my God, things must be really going well for them. They're losing even more money. Yes. Uh, so what is, what is dis- just describe blitz capital and, and, and how it's distinct um, and compares to other forms of capital. So uh, part of, so maybe actually it's a little bit of an interesting lesson in Silicon Valley here. So you had the first internet boom mm. where you had a bunch of crazy companies funded, Webvan, All Advantage, a number of things where what you did a little bit like this is you lost money at small scale and at large scale you lost more money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then a bunch of those business, businesses blew up and then they kind of uh, received business wisdom, the analysts, the commentator said, and this is why those young people in Silicon Valley are kind of crazy and we should have, you know, kind of experienced people with their hands on the wheels selecting where capital goes. Actually, in fact, what happened within Silicon Valley is people learned and they said, well, these business models – that once you get to scale, can correct to being really interesting businesses, and these ones don't. So don't apply massive amounts of capital to the failing business models. Apply them, blitz capital, to the succeeding business models. Yeah, Marketplaces, things that have network effects, things that uh, once you get to uh, the first prize position in a Glen Gary, Glen Ross market, can convert into an interesting business. And so, for example, let's take you know like uh, Facebook. Everyone was like, "Well, this is you know this is just um, you know an unvalued brand impressions, 
uh, you know, even if it isn't just college students and everyone else, it's going to be all this remnant advertising industry. This will never be interesting money, <laughs> right? Well, that's just clearly empirically been proven false. And you didn't have a sense of what that business model was. Mm. It was losing money and not generating a lot of interesting revenue curve for a very long time. And yet it turns out. And so that's the 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 answer the 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 technique of blitz capital is to say, do I think there's at least a good theory, a good, mm. a good plan, a good investment thesis on how that can convert to a good business model? And even without certainty, even without measurement, I will then put a large amount of capital behind it in order to get to first to scale. It's a really distinct skill uh, in terms of that business evaluation because the the attributes of the businesses uh, and the, 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 the core atom of them, which might be the unit economics of, of some component, really varies from scale. I mean, if you look at, a, at, an, at an Uber, it might be at one level done at the city level, but you have to look at the per ride uh, model mode as well. Whereas in a Deliveroo, it's not going to be the city level. It's going to be a a zip code region or a, or a neighborhood. Um, and it'll look very different if you then go to an Airbnb. So there's a distinct set of skills that the the loan officers of today, we call them venture capitalists, but my dad's day would have been a loan officer, um, need need to have. But is it the case then for most of these businesses that it, it is traditionally a uh, a business where the fixed costs can uh, don't rise as much with scale because they're fixed and they can be spread across uh, kind of the global footprint, and you then really understand the variable costs, and you hope that the contribution margin is going to, at some point, exceed the fixed costs. Uh, broadly, that's absolutely true. Yeah. The one thing is, if your revenue would somehow magnify instead, like say, for example, your your fixed costs are going up linearly, and don't and don't have a you don't you're not getting efficiency of costs as you <laughs> scale, but just go up kind of linearly. Which, by the way. Xiaomi, the iPhone, et cetera, you know, it's a very expensive device. Yeah. And you get some manu- you get some manufacturing scale, but it's still a very expensive device. But if you say, well, once we get to a certain amount of size, our revenue spikes and mm. kind of J curves, mm. then that works too. Yeah. No, that's that's very true. It, 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 the thing that strikes me is that that traditional uh company finance doesn't have a way of working with these types of businesses because there's no there's no inventory. That you can securitize. There's no warehouse or no forklift trucks. What there is is a kind of a spreadsheet and a network effect and a bunch of intangible goodwill. So it seems like if there are going to be more and more businesses that are going to look like this, it's going to have to necessitate uh, a real growth in venture capital because traditional bank finance isn't going to be able to do the job. Yeah, or venture capital skill set. However, that's however that's manifest, right? Which is this understanding of these strategic indicators lead to this much this valuable business later um but you're seeing a little bit of our, already in kind of the scale of venture capital going up mm-hmm. right so now you can actually see venture capital rounds of you know 100 million 200 million 300 million or even these later stage massive funds that oh I'm putting in a billion right um and so you're beginning to see more of that now what we want to do is we want to make sure that also you know uh, some of this benefit from these uh, you know, what's happening in the private markets can also happen in the public markets because we don't want to see only all of the major growth happen in the private markets because you want to make sure pension funds and and the kind of more of the bulk of society can also uh, participate in the economic mm. growth. Right, and 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 actually the point being that pension funds have a vanishingly small allocation towards venture capital, even in the rich market of the U.S. Uh, and so, how do you how do you do that if companies are staying? They seem to be staying private for longer um, and allocating more of the rewards to the insiders who can get into the the A's, B's, D's. I've missed out the C's as well. Rounds of, <laughs> of venture financing. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think this is a work in progress. I mean, there's obviously at least two things. Um, one thing is to uh, you know, kind of see if, well, in all of these funds, is there ways to actually, you know, in the funds themselves, venture capital, et cetera, there's ways to actually, in fact, have the pension funds and so forth participate. Um, and, you know, and part of the the question that happened, at least in the U.S., is if, if one LP says, well, actually, in fact, I'm going to report on you every quarter and everything else, then a venture fund that has choice says, well, actually, I'd prefer not to do that because we're 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 functioning at five, seven, ten year time frames, and quarterly reports is not actually how we manage this, and mm. not actually in fact how we want to operate. So you have that set of things within a 
private function. And then within a public function, you want to figure out how it is you can say, well, actually, in fact, we can continue to operate the way we need to, but also be part of the public markets. Now, one of the ways, of course, that uh, Silicon Valley has largely tried to, to, to hack that has been dual class shares mm-hmm. as a way to have to be able to continue that long term um, focus. And, you know, actually, in fact, as because we have a bunch of entrepreneurs, Eric Reese is doing the long term stock exchange right. as a way to say, well, here's a way that we could actually, in fact, systematize that in a equitably fair way with investors and founders across the whole mechanism. And this is a way we can start having uh, stocks that are listed on the long term stock exchange be a, uh, as similarly focused on multiple years versus, you know, a few quarters. Yeah, it's it's so uh, it's fascinating because the the venture business it, with all these very fast moving uh, companies is actually a very slow way to make money. As you say, it's a uh, it's you know five seven years in the company, maybe two or three years in a lockup. I mean, it's a decade, right? To 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 get your to get your return. Um, but I, I'm curious about this other phrase that we that we used earlier on, which was the playbook. Now, just to sort of summarize the idea of a playbook, I guess a playbook is a set of standard operating procedures that you learn in the field about l- launching your new dog walking service in a new city. And then that knowledge is applied to the new city manager, and therefore they can do it with less risk and, and better capital efficiency. One other aspect of the companies that you talked about with Blitzscaling was that for a long time, to the point at which they were often multi-double-digit billions of dollars worth of value, so 10, 20, 30, 40 billion dollars of value, they had had a single founder uh, who had been consistent. I mean, there may have been a, a founding team, but there had been one anchor founder who had consistently been the CEO. And there seems to be some evidence that firms that hold on to their founders, uh, I wrote an article about this called Keeping the Founder Spirit Burning, have a much better return. Is having the founder at the heart of this through that journey a critical part to blitz scaling? Uh, it is on several levels. Um, you know, there are a company or two that, you know, um, manage to succeed without it. It doesn't have to be that, this, that the founder has to stay as CEO. I mean, mm. there's, you know, me with LinkedIn and so forth. All right. But, um, and you cut, you cut your new CEO in as a co founder, actually, after a. A few years, yeah. didn't you? Right. Well, but that's part of like so that's the reason like the founder energy and the focus on the kind of moral authority, the kind of long term vision, the kind of risk taking that founders do in terms of being deeply mission oriented and being deeply multi year oriented. Mm. Then kind of like the hey, as long as it looks good for the time that I'm here and I get my kind of yearly bonus and you know that kind of thing, you want to have a I, I bleed the mission of the company mm. and I will take risks for it. And I have that long-term objective, and that's totally uh, critical. Now, the reason why I wrote that essay um, on LinkedIn and also on my blog site was to say, look, it isn't just that – like if we say the only founders are this small number of people who run the table at the very beginning of the companies, that will give you an arc. And there is actually a way of doing renewals of founders mm. where uh, in particular you kind of focus uh, most especially within uh, the kind of the CEO slot, although – in my book, The Alliance, I also talked about how you could have people on foundational tours of duty and have cultural bearers within the within the company. Uh, but you need to have that kind of dedication and moral authority um, in order to make it work. And so, and and then the most simple version for the startup companies is the founders stay deeply connected um, in whatever function that they're doing. Yeah, it's um, it seems to be that. The that moral authority is something that uh, that it that doesn't come with the job description. It comes with a certain uh, state of mind and a state of belief and a trust that you can build with the with the people around you. Uh, yes, and it is a little bit of um, of a baton, right? So, for example, um, as it and this was again part of ref, of changing the hiring practice of CEOs, um, where you say, okay, we're not just uh, treating you as a kind of hired executive, but we're treating you as a co-founder, mm. right? Which means the kind of the uh, you can you can shift the mission, you can evolve the mission, you can evolve the culture. Um, you can say, look, we're doing X, Y, and Z over the long term because that's really important. I can't prove it as to it being the best thing, 
you know, over one, even one, three, whatever years as mm-hmm. a as a margin or as a, you know, this is the most important business for us to be growing, but it fills out the vision of the company. And, and those things, you know, like part of, um, you know, when I handed out the baton over to Jeff, those things were part of like what I explained to the executive team, what I explained to the board, you know, the boards, I think even in, in like existing large public companies can still do this when they hire a CEO because essentially that's where the... Where, where the where the permission to be mission driven, bold, long term, this will come from, and I think that's uh, that's what I think is really careful. It's not just to say um, preserve the founders you have, but add in new founders, and in particularly any CEO transitions. Yes, and actually that's so interesting because you you the, the I think part of the challenge is with boards of existing older companies, they perhaps don't have the boldness to find founders who are going to be mission driven uh and and vision driven they they're assessing them in somewhat different ways yep and and i actually think that's part of how the competence of actually what is a good board and not needs to evolve too often these board of directors go well i need to have no failure on my watch <laughs> right and mm. sometimes the taking no risk um the no failure is the thing that's taking the much bigger risk over time. That even though the the X years that you happen to be on the board, it all looks fine, but you're putting the company in a very bad position in the future. So you, you need to say, how do we take selective risks that are actually, in fact, um, good for the longevity of the company, the longevity of, you know, for shareholders, for employees, for customers, um, and and which risks do you take? I, you know, one can be... Optimistic. You can. One can also say, well, sometimes these old companies have so much cultural and organizational debt in them that even with the most inspiring visionary CEO, it's a case of managing the business to a, you know, a, a, a peaceful pasture in the north end of the farm. Yeah. And by the way, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes that's the case because of the organizational. Sometimes that's the case because the position the business is in. Yeah. <laughs> right. So. Uh, and those decisions can be, oh, we should sell the business. Those decisions could be, hey, we're going to be kind of a value-driven kind of growth part of the business. And that's part of being um, uh, good mm-hmm. <laughs> right, at making these decisions. The, the companies that we started talking about, though, the blitzscalers, um, don't face those issues right now. And, and I think we can, we can generally agree they've created a tremendous amount of, of value and often a tremendous amount of, of social welfare. But one of the things that's emerging over the last four or five years, covers of The Economist and so on, has been you know, the tech giants, who the blitzscalers, are causing all sorts of societal issues uh, like elephants going through a china shop or through externalities. Uh, and it seems to me that this focus on speed of execution and market share uh, that they have co- may necessarily come at a cost of trying to figure out what are the second and third order uh, effects that we're having within a society. Is, is that is that reasonable or or, or not? There, there's de- it's definitely it's reasonable from the fact that there's trade offs, right? And obviously, from a social point of view, what you would say, well, from one angle of a social point of view, not from all angles of social point of view, because a social point of view, you also want industries of the future, new jobs, mm-hmm. new innovations, new product services. You want all those things too. But you say, look, from a risk mitigation point of view, you'd want every company to go as slow as possible. So you'd study everything. You'd, tri- you'd cross-check it and triplicate. You could have blue ran- l- ribbon panels, study everything and make sure and take right. zero risk whatsoever. And obviously, that would be a disaster on several levels. That'd be a disaster on actually the evolution of the economy. But actually, one of the bigger disasters, because we're in a, a globally connected world, competition comes from everywhere, and that means that you guarantee that your industry will not be the industry that works, that it is in the Glengarry Glen Ross market, doesn't get first prize, it probably gets right. tenth prize. So it's like it's it's like you know uh, it's like you're fired, cubed, <laughs> and so um, and so you need to have you need to be operating within this notion of what is the benchmark of competitive speed? What is that benchmark of making that, you know, who who is going to be the Ubers? Who is going to be the Airbnbs? Mm. Who is going to be the LinkedIn's? You know, right. who is going to be the Dropboxes? How are those going to play out? And um, now within that, and one of the reasons why uh, I wrote the book, um, you know, Chris and I wrote the book on blitzscaling, 
was that it wasn't just saying, look, here's the playbook, here's how you do it, here's how you move the acceleration, all that, all super important to spread that around the world, give many areas a chance to do that. It was also trying to refine the practice, saying, look, one of the things we're beginning to learn is um, how to do responsible blitz scaling. Now, mm. there's still risks at the speed, right. but how do you diminish the really critical risks? And so we kind of said, look, the, the really critical risks are deep impact to individual consumers, mm. serious impact to large number of consumers, and systemic risk, mm. things where you break the system. Right. And, and when you go through these different levels of order of magnitude, you started um, building your organization into a multi-threaded organization. You're no longer just doing one thing. You're doing multiple things. Right. So as you do that, start having some of those things be – proactive risk identification, right, across these three vectors. And you might start with, you know, like when you're at the village stage of hundreds of employees, one or two people whose jobs is we're really paying attention to it, we're making sure everyone else knows what we see and everything else. And then as you go up to the city and nation state, it may be, no, no, we have groups who are working on this. Right. And we've sent people to Washington or to Brussels or to Beijing or whatever it, whatever it is. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's not only um, – we're, we're trying to refine that practice everywhere, including Silicon Valley. And I think that's one of the things we're learning because the key thing that people don't uh, track enough is it's, it's the dynamism towards the future that matters. It's how do we – not, oh, this blitz scaling, slow it down. You know, oh, that's – because by the way, you'll lose the competitive market. It's, okay, within the speed coefficient, how do we make it a much better risk trade-off for society, for consumers, and so forth? And how do we how do we get it so that the risks that are taken, you know, they're they're awkward, they're embarrassing, we'd rather, it's a fender bender, we'd rather it didn't happen, but a fender bender is very different than a, you know, multi-car pile up on the highway. Yeah, you, you know, you've put your finger though on, on one of the, the points that is quite difficult uh, in in this area. So I mean, the way I look at this is um, at a number of layers. So the fir the first is that Lots of our civic infrastructure is now being built by private companies. Uh, the the public space of discourse now happens on social networks. The the, the transport infrastructure happens on ride hailing uh, applications. Uh, the the understanding of our preferences and our behaviors is so much deeper, but it's held in in private uh, groups. And um, that's not a, a necessarily a, a bad thing, but it's worth from, from a, as a European. It's a, the perspective of saying that these things were often things that we would socialize. You know, we have public parks, we have free education, um, and so on. So that, that that was one one issue, and and the question of to what extent can those be handed over without any sort of agreement about the point at which they become utilities that are now that need to be now part of the public sphere. The the, the second issue is that. Is this question of externalities? You know, and externalities are uh, just are, are things that occur in an economic process that are not priced in. So it's like um, it's pollution. You know, I buy a uh, hundred gallons of oil to to power my my generator. I create some CO two pollution. I don't pay for it. Society pays for it. And no business person in history, or perhaps they have started to, has ever willingly gone off and tried to tot up their externalities and said, "Hey, I'm going to pay for those." And as these companies grow faster the risk that they create huge externalities rises. Normally, societal response to externalities is extremely slow. I mean, it took us decades to deal with the externality of tobacco and cancer. Have we even dealt with the externalities of uh, oil? No, not really. And so I see these two things as tensions uh, to which you're, you've made the earlier argument, which is, well, the trouble is if we don't do it, someone else will. And I'm, to I'm sympathetic to, to that perspective as well. But I find this a really hard circle. It's part of the circle that I, I, do I want to square the circle. It's part of the circle I want to connect. Just a reminder, this podcast is supported by Spotify. They've contributed to making music more accessible in the past decade. And I'm excited about their new feature, which brings podcasts closer to listeners all around the world. So find Spotify today and subscribe to the EV podcast there. Now back to our conversation. So uh, working back on the two questions. Yeah. So you know, part of what you need to say is, okay, which externalities are are not like, oh, we'd prefer it's this way or not, but are like, you know, critical. Like, mm. you know, that's part of the reason I identified the three areas of risk that really matter. And it's like, which, which lead to mortality, which, which lead to, you know, kind of massive breakage, or which, you know, by the way, if you get there, you just can't change them, <laughs> right? And they're locked in and that's, re and it's locked in in some bad way. Mm-hmm. In which case, 
You want to get out ahead of those externalities, even though, of course, society uh, traditionally doesn't. And I think the way you do that is you say, well, look, let's try to have public-private work together uh, well enough to try to identify what those are so we can do that. And like, you know, consult with people who are, you know, kind of smart about this and, you know, other kinds of things and try to shape that and, you know, do as best you can. It's always, you know, the the upside downside of human efforts is right. you can sometimes do magic and sometimes you you mess up. Now, what that bridges back to is kind of like, okay, so how do we think about the fact that these things that are social infrastructure, kind of social goods, um, are, you know, kind of less programmed out of society and kind of more programmed out of a set of these emerging uh, companies. Now, um, you know, part of the thing that I kind of encourage in this discourse is say, well, look, what ha- needs to happen from the society is say, look, what we'd like is the following. Like this is, we want it to be more like this and less like this. And so then you, again, that kind of a uh, interface with the company, you say, look, say for example, we look, well, we think we have this really bad problem with trolling, mm-hmm. with how abusive the online system is, possibly to children, to women, to minorities, you know, because it allows these these basically you know kind of Neanderthalic types to crawl out of the woodwork and 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 spread a bunch of hate as a kind of an interesting example. Right. And then you say, okay, well, uh, here's how we think that we would like to kind of measure are the iterative and the evol- evolution of your systems shifting away <laughs> from the the spreading of hate and aggravation to more discourse and understanding. And it could be, well, we'd like to do the following the sentiment analysis, and we'd like you to report on the percentages of what's being mm-hmm. shared or getting amplified on it. Or uh, we'd like you to uh, to have the, the more um, aggressive community management, <laughs> right? And we're giving you permission that when members of the community are, fa- are, are failing this kind of sentiment analysis – you can diminish their position. You can say, hey, they don't share as much or, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing as a way of doing, as a way of sh- – and that has to come from society, right. right, if at all. And as you begin to think about those dashboards, you say, well, it isn't the classic like the regulators come in and say, you know, you will only allow people on the system who have brought out their driver's license and have waved it in front of the camera because we right. have determined that that's the best way to have the real identity system because that locks it in, narrows the innovation space creates it possible that someone who's competing with you who figures out a better way of solving that or a better way of doing that you know, moves around you or can never get there because you've locked it in. Um, and so you say, no, that's the way to try to do that shape. And then um, the last point on the kind of the, the technology companies mm-hmm. and other ones doing this is say, look, also understand that um, frequently it's experiment and refactor. Mm-hmm. It isn't pre-planned with years of study. It's Well, look, take the experiment, (laughs) look at it, and then refactor it. Say, hey, we'd like to change uh, the way that dialogue is enforced in the following way, Mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, filter bubbles for only people talking to people who are of like mind or if it's trolling or, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and we want to, we want to factor, we want to refactor that to get to the following way because a lot of this is actually plastic and movable. Well, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure it is plastic and it is refactorable because it's built in software, not uh, not steel, which is which is wonderful. Um, but I just wonder whether Silicon Valley culture and entrepreneurial culture in general uh, is well set up to to do that. You know, it is the land of um, Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead. It's the land of regulations get in the way. Uh, it's a land of move fast and break things. Uh, it's the land of um, you know, government's not doing it right, so we will out innovate them. Uh, I, I see it as a as a political culture that's slightly that's slightly immature in that sense, and so perhaps hasn't got the uh, the, the desire or the inclination to realise that this kind of engagement with with government or civil society is valuable from a social welfare perspective. Well, it's definitely on the learning curve. So <laughs> right. I, you know, frequently say, "Hey, Silicon Valley this word is kind of teenagers." <laughs> right. So you know, this it's it's gawky. It's like I don't need you, except when I do. <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So the, look, there's a bunch of of work to be done there in this learning curve. I'm optimistic about the learning curve. Now, that being said, for example, I also tend to think that the the network within Silicon Valley innovates uh, more powerfully, more broadly, more fast than government 
uh, tends to do. It isn't to say, like, I'm one of the people who believe that government platforms, the private uh, uh, public uh, connections actually amplify and can be good and so can be done the right way. It's just not within a kind of a centralized program of now we, the government, are the inventors. Um, right. And by the way, similarly, I tend to think invention comes from a very small group, one, two, three people, not from a committee. It goes all the way back even to boards of directors. You have 15 people sitting in a room. You tend to go to the lowest possible risk coefficient, not the bold idea that might work um, in terms of this. And so that even gets worse yeah. once you get up to you know the broad public constituency. So I think there are structural tensions. Now, that being said, I think that the the notion of learning – like we started with like, hey, we're – this is part of the reason in the in Blitzscaling the book, we talk about going from pirates to navies and you start with kind of like, hey, we're the you know Jolly Roger and – Yeah, and so absolutely. I mean the Macintosh building had a pirate flag over the top for a while. Exactly. Back in the exactly. early 80s. It comes originally from Steve Jobs. Yeah. But ultimately what happens is that um, the founders, the companies, the executives – uh, need to also go through the same learning curve when they're going the learning of how to go to market, how to manage, how to build out this new ecosystem of what's the learning curve to be responsible citizens. Like what's the – similarly, as we grow from teenager and adult, what's the way that we say, OK, we have a lot of uh, power and influence here and we need to be the responsible stewards of that power and influence? And how do we do it not just retrospectively but also lightly proactively and in that mechanism? And I think that's – one of the 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 processes we're seeing be, uh, being played out and being learned right now, mm-hmm. and part of the reason I I like this dialogue is I think that you want that baked into the overall um, ethos of how we do it, and it's one of the reasons why we put a chapter in the book, right? You know, responsible blitzscaling. I you know I, I I definitely hear that, and I do agree with you that innovation was often two or three people. Uh, scratching an itch, coming together, throwing ideas takes a, takes a long time. Uh, the thing that I think is sometimes lost is that those two or three people are actually embedded within a society and a fabric and an ecosystem that affords them lots of other inputs and lots of things they they need. There's this great line about Thomas Edison where he says, you know, it's not that I failed, it's that I found 10,000 ways that it didn't work. But during that time of the 10,000 that didn't work, he had to be fed he had to be cleaned. He had to not be attacked by bandits, um, and all those people contributed to the to the ten thousand. And I, perhaps the thing that the British academic uh, Mariana Mazzucato, who's written a book called The Entrepreneurial State, and one of her arguments is that actually there were times, particularly in the history of Silicon Valley, that the government was the the investor of first resort. You know, it was the, it was mm-hmm. DoD spending into. Uh, chips and, and and aviation technology that kicked off Fairchild and and so on, uh, and that perhaps we shouldn't forget the intimate relationship between uh, the, those social goods that are provided. So I think there are there are, there are a couple of things that strike me. One is that you know every bright pair of kids going through uh, Entrepreneur First or Y Combinator is embedded in an ecosystem and a society that's much wider than them that gives them the space to do that. And and the second is that. Even if we look at the the path of of Silicon Valley, um, there was the, there is still a role and has been a role of government in enabling this fundament to be created. So I'm a thousand percent behind this. Like <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I uh, um, that part of the reason, as you know, I spend a bunch of time talking to government officials, not just in the U.S. but around the world. I've done it in the U.K. <laughs> right, done it in France, Italy. <laughs> Right, you know, a, a lot of different places, Singapore, um, and so I think that it is like part of the way I look at the government is government provides a platform, it provides the basis of network. Innovations come out of the network. Mm. The really key thing is that when government people start saying, "Well, I'm the important person, and I'm going to be the centralized control," that tends to be a massive decrease in in potential and realization of value. And the way that the government needs to approach this is say, "Look." We recognize that we're 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 fostering mm. and we're kind of helping uh, sh- uh, kind of influence an ecosystem. We're kind of we're we're being gardeners to it, <laughs> right? In various right. ways, and not you know we are the master planners. 
And if you approach it that way, I think you get much, much better outcomes, right? Yeah. Now, I, would, I think it's still critical because you need the platform. You can't – like entrepreneurship happens within the platform of a society. Laws and talent bases and infrastructure, mm. right? All of that stuff is super critical. And so, you know, you want that uh, positive reinforcement loop. Yeah. I I, I mean, I, th- I think most people probably agree. Uh, I mean, enough of uh, – we've had the experience of commun- communism and uh, – uh, you know, five-year plans and so on, the idea that the central planner probably doesn't get it right or has never really successfully got it right in history. Uh, there's, a, there's a space in between, though, isn't there, as you say, which is we're going to construct a, uh, a, the infrastructure, the network, the enablers that allow this garden to flourish, but you're going to be the one planting the seeds uh, and harvesting the fruit. The thing that strikes me about, about um, a lot of the, the technology companies, though, is that people don't have that level of nuance or understanding um, of society or indeed politics or history that is now afforded to the nature of the products that they're building. Now, I gave a presentation at, uh, at a research group of a very large uh, search engine company a few months ago, uh, and one of my slides to, the, to that group was, uh, there was a group of designers, was um, you came here to design better modal dialogue boxes, you ended up designing political systems, right? And you're now sitting around going, well, now what do we do? Do you think it's an issue that this heavy engineering, um, metrics-driven culture, people who've come through very much a sort of similar set of MIT and Stanford and you know Cambridge engineering um, culture is, is, is real? And does it construct some of the limitations and some of the issues that we've seen arising out of um, internet companies, large and small, um, you know, clashing with perhaps what society needed in some way? Um, I do think it's a real issue in terms of the fact that there's, you know, kind of cognitive shapes, shape what you do. Right. But I think it's always the case. I mean, for example, roughly speaking, in the U.S., I live in a country that's run by lawyers, not by engineers. Right. right? And actually, in, in effect, I've actually been thinking for, for years about writing an essay about how much better off we'd be if it was a country run by engineers versus by lawyers. That doesn't mean there are, isn't really important parts in the law, like human rights and you know, kind of disadvantaged groups and other kinds of things, super important. But what does transactional cost look like? <laughs> you know, what is the balance of the overall system? You know, how does that function? You know, because public policy, you know, getting it like you can't get it, for example, in, in justice to say no one innocent person is ever going to be convicted. It's impossible. There's mm-hmm. no system. What you really want to do is say, well, let's look at the overall biases of the system and see that we'll actually, by the way, we have a racially biased system. So how do we shift the whole system to have you know, not have that racially bias and how do we analyze it on a system level versus on a, you know, individual, like we're protecting that one individual above and beyond everything else. And that's a, that would be a nation run by engineers versus a nation run by lawyers. And so there is, and this is not exalting the cult of engineers. I do think that part of what we need to do is say, look, if these new systems technologically instantiated are the ones that are creating more and more of this, of the social infrastructure, the changes in society, the way that we discourse with each other, the way that we understand truth, then the other folks, the philosophers, the economists, the political science, need to be able to learn and express themselves about how to intervene and change in these systems. Mm. They can't say, stop doing technology. It should be the way I'm trained. It should be my skill set that's doing this. Yeah. That doesn't work. This is the this is the this is the way it's changing. So you need to learn like, okay, well if we're gonna say uh, the new pattern of truth discovery comes through these kinds of technological patterns. Well, then everyone needs to be – they don't have to be constructors of it, but they have to be familiar enough with it and participants enough with it that they can intervene, whether that they're in government or whether or not they're educators, training, engineers, and executives being in the companies or whether or not they're people joining the companies and being able to be helpful participants and how the company you know kind of evolves – you know, that's the that's that's the that's what I think the the direction or the path of the solution looks like. Yeah, it's, I mean, you've you've put your finger on it. Actually, I mean, it is a, ultimately an educational issue. It's one of the reasons I set up the newsletter, actually, which, which was within Exponential View. Can I provide enough depth in technology to people who are coming out of the uh, the sort of social sciences and policy areas and, and and academia and unrelated businesses? And can I provide enough of a 
uh, political economy or philosophical lens into the impacts of the technologies into this space. You know, so to you, can you equip both sides of the equation because you you really need to to understand both in order to uh, in order to make it work. I have to also say, I mean, I think we've made tremendous progress because there are processes that are now actually were pioneered in a sense by tech companies that very much do that. I mean, design thinking and user research, which is it, it's anthropology, uh, is is an essential part now of any of the companies that we have uh, talked about today. And those things are generally quite empathetic and inclusive approaches. So it's not it's not that these companies are, you know, Satan's sitting somewhere. It's more of a question of how do you get that how do you get that balance right? How, you, how do you bring that cognitive diversity to the founding teams and to the decision makers um, uh, and, 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 and so that they don't just look at these things as engineering problems? 100%. And then also the other uh, small addition to what you're saying is, and it's an iterative learning process. It's right. not one digital switch. We flip a switch. It's how do we – okay, how do we get more of that? Okay, how do we get more of that? How do we get it more on target? <laughs> right? And you keep kind of trying uh, small and medium-sized things generally, occasionally large things, uh, to iterate in that direction. The iteration piece, I think, is another uh, lens uh, that comes out of, uh, out of blitz scaling. I mean, it's a key part of the, the, the learning process. You know, you founded LinkedIn, and LinkedIn is the, the dominant employee, work, social network in the world. So you must be thinking quite a lot about – uh, automation and the job market. I just in our last few minutes, I want to get a sense of um, from your perspective what you think is happening. I had a discussion with Kai Fu Lee uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, in that he, you know, identified you know, quite a lot of risks to a lot of people in the large scale of routine, physical, and and cognitive roles um, over the next twenty years. Uh, I really felt that it was an issue that we has to come to the forefront. How about you? Where, where do you see the risks? What do you think is going to emerge? So look, I think we're definitely in a uh, highly inflection transition moment, right? And, you know, kind of uh, parallels are like agrarian to industrial, mm -hmm. right? So you kind of go lots of important things are changing within industries, within what the, the scope of work looks like, within how do you prepare people, what their careers, what their jobs – their, their economic paths are, their roles in the society. I think there's a lot of, of change coming. Now, that being said, a couple of things. One is people have this tendency when they see the new to try to enshrine the past against the future. Mm -hmm. And you're like, no, no, that's just going to kill you. <laughs> right? That's just not going to work. You're going you're gonna to lose out because eventually you lose a grip in the future. Other people who say, well, I'll go to the future, again, get there, and you're in a much worse position. So you want to just say, no, I'm going to accelerate to the future. And then you have to have kind of similar – you need to have solution sets which reflect the nature of the problem, the speed at which it's coming, the size at which it's coming. So I tend to say, well, you know, should we try to slow down automation? No, no, no. We should be keeping automation at full speed, accelerating, but we should be trying to figure out how to help. Right. So like, for example, are there ways that we can get automation to help people uh, reskill or like, you know, for example, should we be trying to incent, you know, kind of uh, technologies which say, look, as opposed to completely replacing, you know, these kind of uh, labor that they integrate with them in new ways and create new opportunities. Uh, we should also be incenting technology that enables new opportunities, just green field, right? And so one of the examples I use there is the Airbnb Magical Trips, which is allow entrepreneurs to be the, hey, I'm in Detroit, and not just a place to stay, but you want a tour of the art movement. Do you want a tour of the the, the microbrewing? Do you want a tour of a – and you can make even Detroit into a, into a tourist destination <laughs> because you enable this, this, this kind of micro-entrepreneurship across the whole network. So you want to look at how do you help – uh, shape and incent and push technology to be part of the solution to the same problems. And then the last is, you know, the, I am ultimately a kind of a techno optimist. I say I'm a techno optimist, not a techno utopian. I don't think just because you build technology, it's all going to work. You have to shape it, you have to work on it, but you can and it can be much better. But that being said, just like agrarian new industrial, the intervening uh, moments will have. Um, some real kind of problems and suffering and footfalls, and we need to help people with those. So like, for example, you say, well, uh, as mm -hmm. we in invent autonomous vehicles, 
It's going to open up all of these new opportunities. It's going to make life a lot cheaper because you could live a little further out from then from the city centers where the economics are. You might create construction booms the way that cars, uh, constructed suburbs, Mm -hmm. you know, in terms of doing this, could do all these things that are very positive. But of course, the people who have jobs right now, I'm a truck driver, I'm a a taxi driver, I'm like I'm a driver, you need to help them with the transition. So you Mm -hmm. need to be able to help with the transitions too. And so ultimately, I'm optimistic about all of it, but that doesn't mean that there's a ton of work to be steering around minimizing what the suffering of the transitions are and to make sure that we accelerate towards good outcomes. Yeah, you know, the, the transition period is, is always the, the difficult one. Uh, and and it, it, it's difficult because actually it, it does re- relate to real people, real families, real partners, real children who will go through a process and may it looks on a spreadsheet. It looks fine. It's one of the beefs I have with some of the job forecasts that are coming out in the last few months where they've identified that automation is going to increase productivity and it's going to create, you know, a hundred and X million jobs and only 75 million jobs will be destroyed. Problem is that is 75 million people who will be non-voluntarily transitioned <laughs> as it were. Uh, and, and that seems to be an area that we have to spend quite a lot of time on, um, in order to, uh, I think, make it as good a process as, as, as we can. I am, in a funny sense, more optimistic about the European societies being able to do that because we've got a history of uh, educating people. We've created social nets. Um, and, and we also have a higher trust society than at least that's what the data shows that than, than the U S has. And my concern as I've observed the U S from a few thousand miles away is that that sort of neoliberal, um, uh, Milton Friedman view of the world, uh, coupled with this notion of the American dream that anyone can pick themselves up and become president is, is going to leave a stony heart in the minds of the, the hearts of the policymakers and actually leave you with, with some quite uncomfortable situations to contend with. So I worry about the two, uh, of course, uh, most especially with the current administration, which I have uh, invested substantial effort in trying to uh, get into change in the next two years. Um, uh, if I haven't sent you, I will send you the trumped up cards. Oh, please right, do. My yeah. Own, my own little cards against humanity mock-up of Trump. And so I do think – it's one of the things I love talking to my European friends about and learning from because I do think it's one of the things that's important – for the U.S. to learn about to say, look, this the the American dream, the freedom of the individual, the entrepreneur stuff is really important, valuable stuff and part of American culture. And then we also need to say, look, uh, within that, where is the also place that we think here is our social responsibilities? Here's how we help all of us get there. And that's not socialism in that kind of boogeyman that <laughs> right. Americans think of it. Um, but it's the uh, it's this question of uh, a healthy civic society. Absolutely. I mean, a healthy civic society. It actually worked extremely well for the U.S. Um, of course, after well, uh, after the Depression and in, after World War II. I mean, it, and strangely correlated with the incredible economic outcomes of the 1950s. So perhaps there's a chance to get to recapture those. Uh, Reed, you've you're, you've got your book out again. Do you want to just say something about the book and where people can find it? Uh, well, so it's 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 uh, launched in the U.S. and definitely in the U.K. as well. Um, and so, you know, any, uh, probably your local bookseller has it, but obviously it's also available in all the major online shops and, and the title is, uh, blitzscaling, Blitzscaling. uh, and it's not just for entrepreneurs and the corporate types. It's also, if you want to understand how technologies will be bringing these innovations to scale and what the pattern will look like and what kinds of opportunities and risks will look like, it's also kind of this, uh, it has this undercurrent of how capitalism is changing and and what's shifting in terms of how uh, technological innovation is deployed at scale. And so if you have any kind of curiosity on that, it's useful for that too. Uh, it's a great book. I, I have read it. I wrote a column about it in my, my FT column a, a little while back. Uh, so I do recommend it. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you. It's been awesome. Hey, it's Azim here. I really love talking to Reed. It's so rare to find an operator and a builder who is as thoughtful as he is, and I really wish the discussion could have run on longer. I'll be back next week with another great conversation, but please remember it really helps us reach new audiences and continue to improve the quality of debate around technology. Please take a moment to share and recommend this podcast. 
And finally, the best way to stay in touch is to sign up to the weekly Wonder Missive Exponential View, which you can find at www.exponentialview.co. That is www.exponentialview.co. Oh, my God.